The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. How do I put that, Max? I don't know. I don't use this stuff. Anybody know how to make that full screen? You. <laughs> Start looking through me. Wait, slideshow is going to do is going to automatically change on me, isn't it? I just want to manually control it. Okay, like that, and then up or down. Okay, All right there we go. All right, the first thing is just going to be basic. Uh, the question of what is spam. Uh, surprisingly, most people don't really know um, the exact meaning of what spam is. It's not just mail that you don't want, there's a little more to it than that. Um, it's about consent, not content. If you uh, signed up to get uh, mail from any particular sender uh, of a certain type, then it's not spam, at least for you. Now sometimes um, you have uh, marketers that, uh, particularly marketers that are um, getting a hold of addresses, and they do what we call repurposing their list. So suppose I sign my daughter up to receive a daily picture of a fluffy bunny. That does not give the sender the right to send um, the other bunny. That's a joke. Come on, Alan, you can laugh at that. <laughs> All right. Um, so... The basic uh, idea there is um, that once you've given permission for a certain type, they can't go and change that on you. Now, if that's in the fine print on, uh, on your agreement when you signed up, then I'd say they're a spammer anyway. Most spammers are only going to send spam, so IP reputation is the name of the game. Um, we find that uh, anybody who is sending some spam is generally spend, sending only spam. Uh, they tend to get list on the, listed on the DNS block list. Okay. Unsolicited bulk email is the generally accepted uh, definition of spam, and uh, it has to be all three of those things. Uh, solicited bulk email, well, that's not spam because you, you ask for it. Um, if you, uh, suppose I look out on the internet and I see uh, somebody's email address and I write them an email, send them a dirty joke or, or, um, or whatever. It's, it might be an obnoxious message. I mean, consider the source. It's from me. It probably is. They're not going to want to receive it, but since it's not bulk, it's not spam. Um, over in the uh, next door, they're talking about uh, bulk phone calls, the asterisk people. Um, well, we're not talking about that here. Those are annoying too, but uh, that's not what we're after. So it's got to be each of unsolicited bulk and email. Um, I give you a URL there for um, the Spam House Project, uh, effective filtering, and uh, According to them, uh, that's been written some years back, but it's uh, still probably pretty close. According to them, approximately 90% of all email in the world is spam. Um, if you're like me, you've probably been somewhat careful with your email address and not getting it harvested by spammers and so on, and you, uh, it might not be a real big problem for you. But um, I find that... Uh, less technical users tend to get a whole lot more spam. How I got into the spam fight originally was um, 
um, I took on the hosting of a um, email services for a very small company and uh, they were getting well over 90 95% spam at that domain. The logs were just constantly scrolling through with, uh, with hits and, and it was just spammer after spammer. Um, in uh, a week time I took that down to 5% and in two weeks time I had that down to 1% and they weren't missing any mail. So they were pretty happy. It really helped their productivity. Um, we all want to know what we can do about spam, and as, as end users, there's really not much, but um, um, we're all looking for the final, ultimate solution to the spam problem, FUSP. That's a fun little acronym to Google up if you'd like to uh, see some jokes about that. There is no final, ultimate solution to the spam problem. There never will be, as far as I can tell. Um, we do have the Boulder Pledge, which is the closest thing, and it's something we can all do. This was from Roger Ebert in 1996. Hit the nail on the head right now, and probably for the foreseeable future, the cost of spam are far less than the benefits to be had by sending it. If we can learn to hit them on the economic front, then maybe we can make progress. That's not going very well. All right, well, as a server administrator, there's a whole lot we can do uh, about being safe and stopping not necessarily all spam, but most of it. Um, what we do is we give, um, when a real MTA connects to us. If for some reason we have misidentified that as spam, we're giving them an in-band rejection message that says, hey, look, uh, here's a URL you can look up. I have, I have a web server with a, a page that uh, is given in the footer. This is something, another reason why you might want to upgrade to 2.8. Uh, this was added in... Uh, either 2.7 or 2.8, I don't remember. Um, anyway, on that page I tell uh, people that I'm sorry if I blocked their spam and that uh, they should be able to get in touch with us through uh, most any free mail providers such as Gmail or Yahoo, whatever. Um, I don't know how many real senders have ever seen that because I looked at my uh, web server some days before this event and I identified at that time about 150 unique IP addresses that hit it. Uh, some of them were people that I knew. Uh, a whole bunch of them happened after I uh, posted the URL on the Postfix users mailing list. Um, there's no way I could try to correlate uh, SMTP rejections with the uh, HTTP hits, so I didn't even try. But I can tell you that nobody has contacted me and said, hey, you blocked my mail. I don't think I am uh, blocking any mail. Now, I do have one of my users here, that Pharaoh of the cowboy hat. Um, you get Slack builds mail through Cardinal, right? Um, can you tell me uh, subjectively about how much spam you think you're getting there? No, because it goes on to your it goes on to your Lizella Net address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't really tried to um, determine this, but uh, I can subjectively say I'm getting maybe one a week or less. And uh, I haven't known of any missing real mail. Yeah, but some of those are not mine. Right. Okay. 
um, I say here, don't use quarantines where real mail might be overlooked or forgotten. Um, I'm not doing any quarantining. Everything goes directly to the user's inbox. Um, sometimes a quarantine or a spam folder is the lesser of two evils, and, and uh, at least there they have a chance to look in if somebody calls them on the phone and says, hey, I sent you that email last week. How come you didn't reply? Um, like I say, it's the lesser of two evils if you have to use a quarantine, but in general, it's not the safest way to handle mail. Um, never discard mail after accepting it. Um, that's, that's just a, a cardinal rule of handling uh, email. Most free mail providers won't do that. I've known Hotmail to do it, but uh, most others it'll go to a spam folder if for some reason they think it's uh, spam by content. Um, now, never bounce spam after accepting it. This is uh, something that um, uh, a really big problem called backscatter that, uh, as you probably know, most of it uh, is sent out with bogus or stolen sender addresses. I'm going to get uh, spam from Alan at lazella.net well, Alan didn't send it to me, but they just use his address. Now, if I'm going to accept that and say, send a bounce to Alan that, uh, um, no, that we can't take this for some reason or the user isn't valid, then that's contributing to the problem. That's making it worse. And the uh, reason I mention Alan is because one time when we had him set up as um, MX for a domain which had never sent mail, uh, a spammer used a, did a spam run and uh, with uh, slackbook.org addresses, slackbook, yes, slackbook.org, and he couldn't even get into his uh, home DSL, wasn't it? Um, because of all the bounces and the um, recipient verification that uh, all these other servers were doing. It just totally ate up his uh, bandwidth. Okay, how are we doing for time? Now there's, it's not perfect, and there's some objections that can be raised to the points I mentioned. Um, there's mail clients like uh, <clears throat> Microsoft, which don't, they try to um, hide the rejection message from the user. Well, gee, what can we do about that? We can't. We do the best we can. Over time, maybe people get the idea not to use um, mail clients that are inadequate, but um, they will or they won't. We do the best we can. And yes, a lot of users will get the bounce and they won't read it or they won't understand it if they do read it. And they won't think that that URL that I give them is something to click on and read. Oh well. If they did read it, we helped them. That's all I can say. We do the best we can. Uh, most objections are going to be like that. Now the final one, uh, you might think that the informative rejection would help the spammer. Well, that's simply not the case for several reasons. First of all, most spam zombies aren't even capable of receiving those rejection messages and passing them back to the mothership. Even if they were, the spammers, there's maybe, according to Spam House, maybe a couple hundred of these people worldwide that are polluting our mail stream. They don't have the time and resources to parse all those messages and find out anything. Finally, um, all I have on there is suggestions on how a real user could get to us. That doesn't, there's nothing on there that a spammer could exploit. I'll punch that uh, page up if we have time at the end of this. Okay, now enter the post screen daemon which um, was introduced with uh, Postfix 2.8. Um, it is a triage daemon that protects the um, uh, real SMTP daemon from 
all the zombies and the known spammers that are out there. Um, I'll show you our numbers and I'll show you actual log output of um, what's going on right now. But um, very few of the connections that come in on port 25 actually make it to a real SMTP server. They're just, ev almost every one is going to be turned away. Um, there's a five stage, I I've divided this into five arbitrary stages, well six, okay, six stages. We're only doing five of them at the Slack Builds uh, server. Um, these stages differ from uh, Dr. Venema's documentation in the uh, uh, post screen readme, the top URL there. <coughs> uh, first thing we start off with is very simple access checks. Um, the administrator can maintain a list of known IP addresses which are either good or bad. If, if we whitelist them in that list, then they go immediately to a real SMTP server. If we blacklist them in that list, they're just cut off immediately with a, um, I don't remember what the message is they get, but uh, they don't get a, a banner. They're just turned away right away. Um, the next stage is, uh, next part of this is uh, the dynamic whitelist that uh, Post screen itself maintains. When a client connects and it is tested in various ways that we're going to go over further down, um, it is listed in the uh, uh, what's called the cache map. Uh, the tests have various lifetimes, and for the lifetime of each particular test, that host is not going to have to be retested. Um, if it is quite listed in all the tests that we're going to do, then it goes directly to a real SMTP server and does not have to, uh, as if PostScreen never existed. The next thing is uh, protocol enforcement. Coding a zombie ratware, as we call it in the anti-spam world, is probably a pretty hard job. They have a lot of challenges to try to get a full implementation of SMTP in a binary that's small enough to run on some Windows machine without the user noticing it and, oh, hey, this thing's awful slow. I'm going to have to reinstall or buy a new computer. Um, ISPs are doing a lot of things to, uh, 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 they can't get out on port 25 anymore and, many consumer uh, ISPs. So these zombies have a lot more challenges than we do if you look at it from that angle. <coughs> they have to try to deliver their mail as quickly as they can. So the first protocol test is called the pre-greet test. In um, RFC 5321, the um, I can't remember the title of that, but that's the current, uh, the successor of 821 and um, the current email standard. The very first communication that has to happen in the SMTP session is called the banner from the server. And there's my server banner up there on the screen. That's what it says. If the zombie, it may not even be able to listen for that um, banner or the coder might not have known that he should wait they, uh, it'll be logged as a pre-greet now we, we catch these by giving them a uh, six second delay it's six seconds under normal circumstances or two seconds under uh, um, what's called stress and um, that trips up quite a few of them. That's uh, one way that um, the DNS block list are helping to identify what is a zombie and what is a, uh, a real mail server. Oh, 
Okay, now this, uh, this is something that I am uh, only started on a, maybe a couple weeks ago. But um, we have at uh, our server, we've got several IP addresses that are bound and listening on port 25. I'm using uh, two of those for email. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, here's an example of the DNS records that we would put up for um, um, multiple MX. Now, these are the same machine. It's not the same thing as a typical um, DNS uh, failover where you've got a secondary MX listening somewhere else. These are the same server. And for example, we have the first one is called Real MX. Um, that's where a real SMTP server should connect and try to send its mail. It comes in on port 25 on what we're showing here is uh, 192.0.2.26. Um, and we've got a secondary one at 2.25. Well, some spammers are going to hit 25 before they hit 26 because they think they're going to encounter less resistance to accepting the mail. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's true. We set um, the whitelist interfaces. We accept our secondary MX IP address, and then we'll accept anything else. So that means if you connect first to uh, 2.25, your server's not going to get whitelist status with me. If they're already whitelisted, however, they can connect to any of the IP addresses I'm listening on and they'll be accepted. Um, one thing I'd like to mention here is this is similar to um, a process known as uh, gray listing, if any of you are familiar with that. Do you do gray listing on your server? Um, gray listing is, is rather annoying to the end user because um, suppose you sign up for uh, a mailing list or whatever and it sends you your confirmation mail and it's told, no, you have to wait. Go away. I don't want this right now. And it'll be added to uh, a white list and um, when you come back again after a certain delay, it'll be accepted. Well, since I have uh, the secondary IP address or secondary MX IP address listening on the same host, they're going to come right back and connect to my secondary and it's accepted. It, it comes right through unless they did something stupid like they're using an outbound farm and it changes IP address. Well, we do the best we can. So in effect that this protocol, this uh, protocol enforcement uh, is a form of uh, gray listing. I think I might have that further on down here too. The next step, this is, um, for me, this was the most important feature of PostScreen. It's um, better handling of um, DNS-based access control, DNS blacklist and whitelist sites. Um, in your older versions, I believe the DNS whitelisting was added in PostFix 2.7. Um, blacklisting has been there all along, but now we can do a scoring system. The old um, uh, SMTPD restrictions that we used, and we were turning away a whole lot of mail even then. I don't think that uh, changing to post screen, it increased us from blocking maybe 98% of spam to maybe 99. It didn't. Uh, it didn't make a dramatic difference for us. But the nice thing about this is we, um, we don't have the all or nothing um, uh, system where if, if a host is listed in a DNS blacklist and we use reject RBL client, well, it's gone. We're going to reject it. And permit DNS WL client is another all or nothing thing. If it's in the whitelist, we accept it and no other tests are done. One thing I put up there is that um, if you're using a DNS forwarder uh, service, 
which is not a good idea on a mail server. I, personally, I don't think it's a good idea at all. But something like OpenDNS or Google Public DNS, you're going to find that you can't resolve the, the um, names on these DNS block lists. And uh, you won't be able to take advantage of this feature. OK, we, um, when we're um, evaluating the list on, uh, that we have, and I'm going to go over what I've, uh, the, the list that I'm using, a positive score is identified as a spam sign, and a negative score is subtracted. That means it's not spam sign. We set a, uh, a threshold value which is a score at or above which the client, we won't take it. Um, and at my site, that is set at three. And we have, um, we'll go over the scores here in just a moment. Those will be logged in the um, logging as DNSBL rank number, the number being the score that's added up um, for the client IP address. Okay, here we're getting into the nuts and bolts. The, um, the first set that I have here, these are the highest scored uh, sites that I'm using. These are ones that I'd more or less be comfortable with just to use uh, rejecting outright. Um, first at three points is um, zen.spamhouse.org, which is the industry standard. Um, it is not free for all use. If you're um, a business over a certain number of uh, users, or I guess they do it by email uh, volume, you do have to pay for a data fee. However, the cost per mailbox is pretty low, and if you consider the cost of lost productivity of spam, it's a bargain. If you're an ISP, well, you'd have to pass that on to your customers, but, uh, but still, they'll be happy with you in the long run if you go ahead and pay for that subscription. Next is the, uh, the Barracuda real-time block list, BRBL. And um, for that one, registration is required. You have millions of Barracuda devices all over the world that are receiving spam hits, and they're sharing notes with one another and, and their uh, mothership, so to speak. And um, Barracuda, after quite a rocky reputation in the anti-spam world, has finally given us something back. They're giving us a really good blacklist. Third one, and you gotta love this name, spameatingmonkey.net. Um, that's a fellow I know from IRC that runs it, and uh, he's doing a real good job. It's, uh, it's highly accurate and very effective. Um, the last two, uh, njabl.org, ahbl.org. NJABL stands for um, not just another bogus list, and um, AHBL is abusive host block list. They are um, well-run, long-time services that I have a lot of respect for. However, they're not, uh, they're not performing that well in my numbers, as you're going to see here in a little bit. Okay. Now this is the advantage of post screen is that we can bring in, rather than just the, the heavy hitters that uh, we'd use to reject outright, we can bring in some lists that are a little more aggressive. And here they are. Um, these only get one point each, but uh, they've been adding up quite a bit. The uh, spam cop block list is an automated list some of you may be familiar with that uh, you can send your your spam into and uh, it will add uh, it will list the IP address that sent it uh, since it is automated and since we do tend to get spam through compromised Gmail accounts or uh, uh, some spam zombies even control hotmail and Yahoo accounts and and some Gmail, I believe. Sometimes those outbound relays are going to be listed as spam sources, and uh, these more aggressive lists are going to list them. 
The same thing is true of SORBs. It is a um, manually run list from a um, fellow uh, um, lady in uh, Australia that um, is, has a reputation as being more aggressive. I don't doubt that the uh, listed host actually did send uh, spam to the SORB spam traps, but sometimes those are going to be hosts that we're going to want to go ahead and take their mail anyway. Um, Turbo spam is a new one. It's a um, um, spam trap driven list. I, I don't know if it's manually or, or uh, <coughs> semi automated. I'm sure it's semi automated at least. But um, there too, it's more aggressive. I wouldn't totally trust it. I've seen quite a few um, email service providers that are uh, sending borderline marketing mail that are listed on that list. Now we go on to uh, whitelist sites and I've got two whitelists that I use and um, I adjust them by the score, well by the return value. Um, if you're not familiar with how these uh, block lists work is you look up the IP address very similar to uh, reverse DNS lookup and uh, um, it'll, it returns an IP address and a text record that says, gives information about it. Um, the first one we use there is the Spam House whitelist. <coughs> Excuse me, very uh, exclusive club there. It's only open by invitation from other whitelisted entities. It's uh, very hard to get on. It's impossible to be listed on the Spam House uh, whitelist and blacklists because they're using the same uh, uh, network of DNS servers. Um, that's why I only set it as a minus four because it's never going to have to offset the Spam House three. Uh, I don't get very many hits of uh, SWL listed host. Um, over time, they may start to add on to it. I'm not listed on there. Um, so I've never also, I've never seen any overlap between DNS blacklist and SWL. So it's not really making much of a difference one way or the other. But in case somebody did have a problem, then this would give them the benefit of the doubt for at least one try that they can uh, fix their problem and stop sending out the spam and we might we might get a spam message, but we might uh, get a real message. Okay, the next thing is a, um, a DNSWL.org. This is a DNS whitelist. Uh, um, I believe these people are in Germany and they have uh, various trust levels. The IP address that is returned on a lookup is uh, going to indicate what the trust level for that host is. They've got four. First is trust level zero or none, which um, we get quite a few of these from uh, uh, marketing providers and ISPs that may not be very well managed. So sometimes there could be, um, there. sometimes I do see overlap between blacklisted and whitelisted hosts. That's why I only gave them a minus two. If they're listed in um, two or more of my uh, uh, high scored blacklist, then the trust level none is not going to prevent me from rejecting them. Um, next is the trust level low, which is um, mostly uh, uh, ISPs and consumer, or I mean uh, uh, marketing organizations from what I've seen. Uh, I take a, off a minus four there. It's pretty rare that we would not want to take that uh, their mail. And finally is um, trust level medium or high. <coughs> My own host is listed in the uh, medium range there. Uh, that's uh, ending in a dot two or dot three on the IP address's return. These hosts are known to be 
not managed by spammers, therefore they are uh, uh, given a little um, more credit. I take a minus six off for those. And again, I've had very little overlap with um, blacklistings. Usually only the um, uh, more aggressive of the, uh, uh, such as spam house or spam cop or sorbs might list them. Uh, one that you all may if you're ever on the Linux kernel mailing list, vger.kernel.org is a uh, trust level high, and it is also listed in, I believe, SORBS. So I don't want to take SORBS word for that. I want to take the NSWL word. Okay. Bayesian filtering is um, is content based. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You can. It's it's kind of like that. Basically, we're not. We don't have to take one list's word for it. That one list says you're a spammer. But if two or more agree that this is probably a spammer, then we've got more evidence and uh, confidence in rejecting them. Okay, the next thing is um, the, um, what's called the deep protocol or after 220 tests. And yes, I, I mentioned the gray listing here. This is where PostScreen becomes a gray lister. Um, the SMTP engine in PostScreen is not capable of processing real mail. It's just a fake. If it starts speaking SMTP to a client, that client is going to be rejected for one reason or another. We don't necessarily know what that reason is going to be yet, but we know that we're not going to take their mail in this particular connection. They're going to have to disconnect and come back. Um, that's just a design limit and it's also a benefit because, as I mentioned earlier, you do get the, the gray listing action in that uh, the first time a spammer comes, uh, they have to come back again. Well, uh, I'm finding that a lot of the uh, zombies do run through their list more than once. Gray listing is not as effective as it once was. It does reject a lot of spam. Some people swear by it. I personally don't like it. I stopped doing it years ago, but then with PostScreen, I started doing this again in May. Okay, there's three tests that we do after 220, and um, these are the settings to enable that. The first one is um, the pipelining test. In um, Extended SMTP, the ESMTP uh, uh, extension for uh, pipelining, when, uh, when an ESMTP client connects and it says, I don't know how much you know of SMTP, but EHLO, it says, tell me what you can do. And uh, then the server replies back with its list of capabilities. PostScreen is not going to list pipelining as one of the capabilities. Therefore, if one of the um, uh, clients is going to try to do pipelining, which is where you, you give, you com combine two or more commands on the same line in SMTP, it saves a lot of time for handling real mail, and it also saves spammers time, which is what they're interested in. Um, well, we know that somebody who does pipelining, it's at least a poor SMTP implementation, so we're going to reject that because we've got the pipelining enabled, uh, pipelining test enabled. Uh, next is uh, the non-SMTP command, and this is something that the uh, um, SMTP daemon has implemented for many, many years, that a lot of the zombies out there well, I don't know who wrote them or why, but they're not really speaking SMTP. And uh, 
they're real easy to reject because, well, we couldn't take them anyway. They've got to speak valid SMTP for us to understand what they want to do. Well, we cut them off right away when they issue uh, a command such as a, a, you see a lot of post HTTP commands that they might try to, to execute. Those are real easy to get rid of. We don't see that many of them, but, uh, but uh, there we do. There we, that's what we test for. Um, another, uh, the bare new line enable us. Uh, I took the quote directly out of the, um, the post screen readme from uh, Dr. Venema. Um, being a line orient protocol, those lines are required to end with a carry return, carriage return line feed. Sometimes um, zombies will just send a bare line feed and uh, that's not allowed so we uh, can consider that a spam sign. These don't catch very many but as a group they force the after 220 test to happen so we get the um, the gray listing benefit that was mentioned before. Now when a client passes all the tests that uh, it's been speaking to the uh, post screen daemon, um, it'll be logged as a service currently unavailable with a 450 SMTP code in the uh, 432 uh, DSN. And uh, then it also logs uh, past new. That means that uh, it was not currently in the cache map that we talked about earlier. And it's going to be added to it with all the tests passed. It was not in any of the uh, um, uh, DNS, uh, it was not blocked by the DNSBL scoring and it passed all the after 220 tests. Now then it goes uh, directly on to uh, an SMTP daemon the next time it comes in. Uh, here are the, um, the test lifetimes and uh, the way he set it up is that uh, the, the tests that are imp harder for the um, um, client to deal with have a longer lifetime. We don't want to make them jump through those hoops as frequently. The, um, the first one, the uh, <clears throat> DNS uh, BL time to live, this test usually only takes a second or two for all the um, uh, DNS queries to go out to all the uh, blacklist and whitelist. Uh, since it only takes a second or two, it's not that big of a deal to make them wait and we only cache that for one hour. Um, if they come back during that hour, then they're still whitelisted as far as post screen is concerned. The next is the, uh, the greet, uh, the pre-greet test and uh, this is the six second delay. So we cache that for a whole day. If we know that they're not going to speak out of turn, then we'll give them a whole day to uh, um, be whitelisted on that. Uh, the 30 day, these the after 220 tests are all 30 day um, uh, time frame. So they don't have to uh, jump through those hoops except once every 30 days. Now that's the end of uh, what PostScreen is doing. Uh, some folks are wondering is, well, should I take off my, uh, my SMTPD uh, access control rules that I was using before? As I mentioned earlier that uh, we're doing pretty well, we were doing pretty well before we had PostScreen. We didn't have um, a whole lot of spam getting through. Uh, we're blocking a little bit more than we were <coughs> that was getting through. But um, there's some limitations in what PostScreen does that um, uh, it can't, that the SMTP daemon does not have uh, a problem with. First thing is that uh, reverse DNS names are not looked up. Um, PostScreen simply does, is not coded to do that. It's meant to be fast and light and that's what it does. It, 
uh, it's not going to act on the uh, reverse names. It also cannot act on sender or recipient addresses or domain names, which um, uh, there's a, uh, there are right-hand side block list, RHBL, RHSBL list, such as the spam house DBL, domain blacklist, that um, I'm finding are getting quite a few of the ones that are making it through post screen. Uh, most domains in the world are controlled by spammers, and the ones that are actually being used in spam get into those lists. Well, we may let them through post screen, but we're going to catch them at the SMTP daemon. Um, hello and EHLO commands. These, this uh, is very effective in our old setup. We, many of the spam zombies will uh, send a non-fully qualified domain name. As you know, that's one of the most effective uh, restrictions we had. Um, before PostScreen, that was blocking about 25% of all the connections that I got. Um, the, spam, they'll, the zombies will say, uh, hello localhost or, or hello um, with your IP address, whatever. And uh, those are very, were very effective. We still have those restrictions in the, um, in the real SMTP daemon. I didn't take out any of my SMTPD restrictions, even though they're not doing anything now. At least they're there. We can fall back on in case of stress. Now, suppose that uh, we're being attacked by spammers from uh, different angles, a, a distributed denial of service, or as I mentioned with Alan's uh, situation, the uh, um, um, backscatter attack. Well, sometimes our uh, DNSBL response might be a bit slow. It'd be a shame if we didn't have SMTP daemon looking up those uh, IP addresses too, because by the time it tries, it will be there, it'll be cached, and it's going to take just a split second to say, hey, you're listed. Goodbye. Now, the next stage is uh, uh, content scanning, and I'm not a big fan of that. It's not something we need on our server. What we're aiming for is what I call the JHD level, just hit delete. If it's not too inconvenient for the user to just hit delete, then I think we did a decent job. They don't have to scan through page after page after page of spam. They just have maybe five or ten real mails and maybe one or two, well, maybe less. But there won't be comparatively very much spam. It's not worth my trouble to try to block all that stuff. Um, however, very heavily spam sites do need it. Um, we have, uh, Postfix has uh, a few means of implementing that. Uh, only one of them is native. Uh, header and body checks, which um, the feature is not as good as you might think. A lot of people think it's going to do a lot of things for them. It doesn't. Um, my little saying there, that's my own quote, he who thinks header body checks are the answer was probably asking the wrong question. Because all it does is it takes one header and looks at it. Here's what a header might look like. You've got the header token, which is going to be title case separated by hyphens, the colon, the white space, and then the content which can be continued on lines that have leading white space. We can only look at one of those at a time. We can't compare, well, if it's got the subject says spam in it and it's got the spam score header. No, we can't do anything fancy like that. Um, there's other uh, worthy means of content scanning. Mavis D. New is a uh, Perl-based um, uh, interface between SMTP daemon and, uh, and spam assassin. It can also do uh, virus checks, although in my experience, it's not worth the trouble. Uh, I had um, the, I mentioned, I set that up for that heavily spam domain I mentioned earlier. He's going to make me shut up here in 30 seconds. And um, it wasn't really, uh, I, in a matter of months, I'd catch one or two with the uh, clam antivirus. We also have SendMail Milter support, which uh, requires the libmilter binary. 
Uh, I'm going to have to cut this off, but um, we'll be able to look at these uh, 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 slides if you are interested. If you're not, I'm glad you survived the talk. If you have any questions, well, probably have to get with me later because uh, we don't have any more time left. <laughs> I put on here all the settings that I use, and I posted it on the Postfix mailing list. If you're interested, get with me, and I will uh, point out, well, you can Google Rob Zero Postfix hyphen users and post screen. You will find the post I've made once was on February uh, 15th, and another one was just in May sometime. That was it. <laughs> what about this? I can help with I like it. it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found idea. a problem. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.